one. All right. Welcome, everybody, to hour 23, I believe, of the 24-hour 3WL podcast for raising money for engineers without borders. I apologize if I slur any words or if I start slacking off in this particular hour. Uh, again, been up 23 hours, so <laughs> it's it's going to happen, and uh, I haven't had any energy drinks in me. Uh, I have Demax Man with me, who's going to be co-hosting with me today. Say hi, Demax Man. Bonjour. Bonjour. Uh, and we are currently hosting one of my favorite guests and somebody I've been very excited to interview, uh, Matt Dillahunty. Hey, thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I'm actually the, one of the reasons that I've been excited is because you've been on the show twice and yeah. I've missed both shows. Uh, so that was plan. I keep missing the chance to be on a show with you and now I have my own hour and it makes me happy. Hooray. Um, okay. So, uh, for everybody who's, who's currently watching, we are currently sitting at 32, 12, uh, as far as donations go, which is a great amount. Um, well, let's try and get it. Maybe to 3,300 by the end of the hour. But that'd be awesome. I'd uh, least appreciate that. Shoot for the stars. Let's go for one mil. Sure, let's go for a million. Uh, some random billionaire just walks in and just goes, hey, what's this? Oh, and there's that board. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. So uh, to begin with, uh, Matt, I, it, one of the problems that I always have uh, whenever I'm trying to interview somebody who goes through so many other interviews is to try and not come up with questions that you've always been asked, like, how did you become an atheist? Or what's your favorite call on, the AET, on AETV? Or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's very difficult because you've been in, like, a million interviews. Uh, or at the very least, you've been asked, like, so many questions at the end of, like, debates that you do. Um, so I guess one of, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, one of your, your most recent debate, I believe, was with Sci10, right? Yeah. Um, that seemed like a very torturous uh, uh, period of time for you. Like by the end of it, it didn't even seem like you were at all interested in being in the building. Like uh, you're, you kind of had your 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 your, shul- your shoulders slumped a little bit, just going, "I don't, I don't even want to be here." <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's kind of the attitude that I think Sai gives a lot of people. What, what what were your thoughts going into that debate? Did you actually did you like expect anything? Uh, in particular? Well, I expected pretty much what we got. Uh, first of all, the process of getting the, the debate to even happen was far more torturous than the actual debate. Um, I actually had a good time during the debate. You know, the, the reason that, that I might have looked like, you know, I'm done with this at the end of it is because I was done with it, which is what I pointed out in my closing remarks. I don't think anybody needs to waste any time on this. Um, but also, he'd, you know, he'd been an ass during the process uh, with respect to Sarah, and then he was an ass from the stage to her, and then when it was over, he refused to take a picture with her. Now, I don't care how much I dislike somebody. If they're the, the organizer who just gave me a podium to speak to a whole bunch of people and a chance to, to film something and, and get the word out to more people, I don't care how much I dislike that person. I'm going to pose for a damn picture with them when it's over, and he just you know refused. So uh the debate itself not nearly so painful as as uh some people were were suspecting i got pretty much what i expected what i didn't expect was for him to use quite so many clips of me uh in his opening and his rebuttal and his closing it was just uh i've never been allowed to speak so much in one debate it it was a really nice uh autobiography on you it it was he put together there it, it made listening to his segments a lot a lot easier because I got to have Matt sprinkled in between everything he said. <laughs> the no. thing that was funny was I expected him to use clips because he'd like you know sneered from Twitter at some point. Uh, oh, thanks for this. This is so much more material for me. So I figure he's going to use clips. And if you watch the beginning of that in his opening, he went first. Um, I started taking notes, which I do every time I'm doing a debate. And then the first clip of me comes up and I'm thinking, oh, boy, you know, he's got some clip where I've said something uh, about which I've either changed my mind or clarified my position, something I'm going to have to explain or walk back. And so I started, you know, taking notes and I didn't disagree with the clip or see a problem with it at all. And then there comes another clip and another clip and another clip. And I realized 
he's he's doing a mock debate with me and I don't disagree with what he's showing. So I'm just going to sit here. And there's a point where I just kind of put down the pen and sit back in the chair and relax and, and lean back for, for all of his opening. It, it kind of it was a very strange sort of meta uh, debate in many ways, uh, because, as you said, he was sort of having a debate with you during his opening already by having your your clips. And then there was what I thought was very funny was uh, your first rebuttal that you already had pre-written uh, yeah. t- to completely predict everything that he was going to say. <laughs> like, I didn't need to change anything in this. Uh, I already knew everything he was going to say, so I just wrote down a rebuttal. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and to be fair, you know, one of the things I'm doing, I'm I'm setting up a, a Patreon channel, and I'm planning on taking the debate and chopping up into pieces and adding some commentary to it as part of the part of the content for that channel, so that I can speak a little bit more about what went right, what went wrong. I mean, mistakes were made on both parts. I I misdefined something, I'm, and it wasn't you know catastrophic. But as I sat there. Um, that pre-written rebuttal was an idea that I had um, kind of early on, and I really struggled with the idea of doing that because you want to make sure that you're responding to what your opponent says. And by and large, if you if you go through the points in the rebuttal, it covers most of what he said in his opening and some of what he said later on and even during the, uh, the Q&A. And, um, but it's not... It, it's not really the best, you know, I'd never do it in any other situation. It was mainly to show how predictable he was. And I meant to expand on this to talk more about how we live life by making predictions about the world that we live in. And it, so there were parts of his argument that didn't get rebutted. Um, basic, but one of the first questioners actually uh, addressed it. And also, size position is not that we can't know anything. His position is that the, the, we do know things, and the reason that we know things is because of God. So ultimately, pre-writing it um, wasn't so much a rebuttal to his position. It was it was supposed to be an exercise in showing that the way we have to live in the world is based on making predictions. And even if I can't ever be absolutely certain, I can be certain enough. And I think the audience generally got that. You know, I think that they understood it. But there are some other people who are like, "Oh, that was you know just so dishonest for him to do it like that." Between I between um, the debate with Sai and the debate with um, uh, Banana Man, which one do you think was more of a slaughter? <laughs> um, well, neither one of them won a debate. Uh, that's that's the thing, and both of them, you know, I ended my closing remarks by saying, you know, there's no reason to to debate with these agree to debate these people ever again because they're they, they flatly admit that they don't want to debate and that's the this the thing that kind of caught me off guard with ray because i'd had ray on the atheist experience before and ray is an evidentialist and curiously enough one of Sai's best friends who was also there at the debate uh in memphis uh um eric Ovind, his dad is an evidentialist and eric is an evidentialist but if you listen to ray recently like the, the debate that i did with ray comfort on christian radio He's not being an evidentialist anymore. He came on and flatly said, I don't have any interest in proving that God exists to anybody. You guys already all know that God exists. He was basically borrowing from the precepts. And Eric is in this unusual position of seemingly being both an evidentialist in honor of his father and his upbringing and a presuppositionalist in honor of his friend Cy. And so he's got, he's got the most confused state of affairs you could ever imagine. And so I... You know, to me, I can't really say which one was um, more of a slaughter. I think, quite frankly, the the one with Ray uh, is the one where s- somebody may have embarrassed themselves the most because at least Psy, in saying that he didn't have to prove that God exists, which is wrong, uh, at least participated in something kind of debate-like, whereas Ray just got there and said, I love you and I don't want you to go to hell. And I know it was, a, I told the, the radio station, you know, I'd been on before the, the debate with Ray. And I said, you know, I, I feel like you guys owe me an apology. If you're going to invite me on to do a debate, you should at least find an opponent who wants to debate. So just sitting there saying he doesn't. Well, um, that leads into a follow-up question. Um, who would you say is, was your most challenging uh, debate opponent and also, um, who who would you like to debate? Who are you dying to get your your claws into? 
Um, as far as a challenging debate, uh, man, that's hard. I, I've done better in some debates than others. I can, I can easily pick out, you know, like my best and worst debate performances along those lines. And actually, I think both of them happened against Cliff Connectly. I think my first debate with Cliff, um, having been sick for several days, I was just kind of sitting, sitting there, you know, it wasn't very animated or involved really much at all. And the second debate with Cliff, uh, I went there for redemption. And so I thought I did a much better job as far as, uh, challenging. I, I enjoyed debating, uh, John Ferrer. He's, um, one of the few who actually corrected me on something. I had a, um, a proposed solution to the is odd problem and I and John uh, corrected me and just in the course of the debate by saying one thing the right way um, he changed my mind and let me re- help me recognize that I was wrong about the way I was phrasing something uh, during a debate and so well I don't know if it was necessarily the most challenging one it was it was the most productive and it, oh the second part of the question was who would I most like to debate um, you know, probably Craig or Ravi Zacharias or somebody like that. That that's actually quite brave because William Lane Craig is quite the slippery little mouse. He always tends to sneak his way out between the fingers there. Hey, and I I apologize for doing this, but I have to actually step out for just like one minute, and I will be right back, and I'll give you I don't know five ten extra minutes if you want to run over. That's okay. Be right back. Okay, Lundy, question for you. Who do you want to debate? I want to debate all comers. Uh, <laughs> no, I've actually, I actually had an idea a little while ago where you remember, um, I forget his, I forget, Shock of God, that's his name. Oh, fuck. You remember him? Uh, How so could I, I forget? So I watched, He was driving by Logic's house last night. <laughs> so I watched uh, a debate that he did with uh, Steve Shives. And Shock actually takes Craig's methodology and rhetoric uh, and takes it to a whole new level. Like, I, his, his, his debate style is quite literally to make as many arguments as possible in his first opening thing and then ridicule you for not debugging all of them in your first opening if you don't. Well, that's a standard tactic, right? William it's, Lane it's Craig did the same thing with Hitchens. But 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 Shock did like okay, so William Lane Craig does like five arguments usually. He usually has his five go to ones. Shock did like forty arguments. <laughs> and he just kept listing them off rapid fire. Didn't bother defending any of them, didn't bother explaining any of the premises. He just went rapid fire with them. It's just like, uh, this argument, which is this, this, and this, and that means they gotta exist. This argument, which is this, this, and this, and that means they gotta exist. I loved that. And I'm like, I kind of want to debate him because I think it'd be funny to do the exact same thing in reverse because most just, arguments are really easy to rebut in like one sentence. So I just wanted to do that. I just thought mean, that would be a really fun thing to do. Just, just completely flip the script on him and just rebut every single argument in less time than it took him to put forth the arguments. You use the machine gun argument argument, huh? Pretty much. And then maybe like add two, three arguments of my own in there, just for funsies. <laughs> so I'm back. Uh, thanks. I'm back, and I kind of missed part of that. But the idea of being able to rebut something quicker than it can be presented, you know, with, with people using kind of the gish gallop approach, and and it's much easier to say something wrong in just a, a couple of seconds that might take you know ten minutes to rebut. Uh, I'd love to be able to do that. First of all, I'm not not prone to short answers as we're all aware in the first place. Um, but man, that'd be awesome. And that's one of the reasons why I was looking forward to having the pre-written rebuttal. But the problem with the rebuttal is that it was long and I had to go fast and there was not much breathing. And so the presentation of it was, was not great. You had to kind of trust that everybody just kind of listened and gleaned something from it and then realized uh, you know, just how dense this was and how thorough of a response it was. See, for me, it depends on the context of the debate and the format of like what exactly your opponent is trying to do. 
because uh, I've seen plenty of debates where there's an honest attempt for from either side to truly convince the audience of the truth of whatever premise they're defending or going or uh, going against. Um, but there's also plenty of debates that I've seen where it's not like that. It's more a, just entirely a rhetorical game uh, to try and make the other person look silly. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, I'm aware that there's a lot of things that I can do to uh, engage with that and actually kind of flip the script. And like uh, what you missed out on was essentially, I, I know, I know you're aware of this guy, shock of God. Um, I watched, <laughs> I watched him do a debate and his methodology was similar to Craig's in the sense of making a bunch of arguments in the opening and then shaming somebody for not rebutting all of them um, in what, in like their, their, either their opening or their first rebuttal. Um, but like he made, like 40 arguments and unlike Craig, he didn't attempt to like explain any of the premises or defend any of the premises. He just kept going premise one, premise two, God, premise one, premise two, God, premise one, premise two, God. He just did that rapid fire for the entirety of his opening. Um, and so all I, ha all I wanted to do was look back over his debates where he's used all these arguments, write down like quick, quick one second, one, one sentence things I could say about each one that said that, just at the very least creates doubt about them. And then just, if I did a debate with him, just wait for him to do all of his arguments that he can possibly list. And all I would do is just go, he used this one, he used this one, he used this one. Yeah. And then just read off the sentences that I have for each one and then throw away the paper and go, so here's a couple of my own arguments. So he can't do the whole, you didn't respond to all my arguments, bull crap. Um, but in that sense, there's nothing productive really going on. It's really just a, kind of a dick measuring contest uh to say the least actually that 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 raises the question um as far as debates go what what do you matt what what's your own opinion of like say the uh the ken ham debate where ken ham's not there to really <laughs> present <laughs> any actual I, evidence okay. is it yeah, yeah, i'm getting a video of the fingers. which means you guys might be able to hear this but not for yeah. long uh, proudly introduced and to i can't mute tidy cats life <laughs> later it has a weight, but with so so evidently they've invented this incredibly content. lightweight tidy cat yes. litter. Um, so the pinky might just become the most used finger. Thank you. Bye uh, bye, heavy litter. Goodbye, commercial. <laughs> yeah, gas. All I did was try to create an account. Uh, I didn't even want the video playing. I just wanted an account so that I could respond in chat. Um, okay, but so yeah, the, wait, what? To, sorry, to, like. Uh, Last night, in while well, you're streaming Path of Exile, there I, I said, you know, um, present facts, not tactics, and whatnot. And you made a really good case for um, presenting tactics as being an important aspect of debates. And I agree with you. Fair enough. Um, my 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 thing though is like, um, I don't know how do I even articulate this. What it, shouldn't it, it? It matters who you're appealing to, does not? Um, if you're appealing to the skeptics, tactics, they're going to see through that and look for the evidence. Whereas if you're trying to convert, say, creationists, perhaps tactics might be a better route. Well, I, guess, I think it depends partly on the subject. Um, let me let me kind of backtrack a second to get you both answers to things that were happened right before the commercial. Uh, first of all, the idea of having stuff ready to go. There are a lot of debaters who create index cards so that like, oh, uh, he said problem of evil. So here's my quick 10 second thing to problem of evil. Here's he is co cosmic Kalam. So here's my quick 10 second thing to Kalam so that you can get to your stuff. Um, I don't actually do it on index cards. I just trying to do it mostly from memory. Um, but when it comes to this idea of facts versus tactics, um, and by the way, thanks for hanging out in the, in the Twitch uh, stream. It's um, it's not that, I what what you had said was you know use tax or use facts and not tactics, and, and I really think that you should use both when you can. By all means, if there are facts that are going to rebut a position, present them. Um, it doesn't so much I think depend on the audience as the topic, the subject that you're talking about. If in fact the, or the position that you're opposing is one that there aren't facts that actually rebut it, um, then you have to do it at kind of a meta level. You have to talk about do they have 
a, a, a sound epistemological foundation for their beliefs. And if they don't, then those are the facts that you present, the fact that you know, here, here, your, your argument has this fallacy, et cetera, where you're exposing things. And by all means, make use of facts. But the tactics part of it, um, you, you take a look at the debates that actually have, uh, have clearly had an impact on people, maybe some of the ones where they voted and people changed their minds. Um, there's a mix, and it's a really... Uh, it, there's kind of an art to it, and I'm not necessarily the best. My goal is to keep getting better, but but the the art process of this is you have to be able to reach an audience if you are up there and you are dry and boring. And this is one of the – so the, I had two debates with Cliff Connectly. The first one, I'd been sick for five days, so I just kind of sat there, and I read my opening, and I was um, not very animate. I was not very passionate. I did not make a connection with the audience. It's not that my arguments on the merits of what we were discussing were any worse than they were the second time. The second time um, I presented some of the, some similar arguments, some similar facts, some similar rebuttals, but there's a theater component to it where you have to be able to connect with people and you have to make them, uh, if they don't like you, they're probably not going to care about what they say. As unfortunate as that is, it seems to be the reality we inhabit. And so being able to connect with them on some level, this is one of the areas where, um, and I'm not sliding Dawkins and, you know, for all the, for all the Dawkins fans, don't come beating me up. You know, he, 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 he has said that he wants to be on the atheist experience. We we're happy to have him on. Um, but I having spent 25 years as a Southern Baptist fundamentalist Christian, um, when it comes to debating, those sorts of people, I have an advantage that Dawkins doesn't. And that is that having lived this for so long and being able to make it clear that I've lived it so long, um, I can connect with some audiences, not all of them, uh, better than he can in a debate. Like um, the times when people quote the Bible and don't know which particular verse and you tell them. Well, I always that, get a kick. And the fact that I'm woefully undereducated, um, you know, Richard is very Oxford, and that's amazing. And he's one, you know, a great advocate for science. And I love listening to him talk. Um, but I, because I'm coming from a different angle, I've got this background which tends to to show up when I'm challenged on my like uh, Christian cred. It's there. I've I've got that cred. And so because it, I spent so many years believing the things that they believe for similar reasons in similar ways, it's a lot easier for me to make a connection in some cases than it is for him. And that, you know, depends on the topic of the debate. If you want to debate creationism versus evolution, I'd be happy to do it, but I'm not necessarily the right guy. In that case, you probably want somebody like Aaron Raw. Uh, and I'd rather not have Dawkins do that debate, and he'd rather not do it either because it elevates creationism. Um, and I'd rather have scientists doing science things and science advocates doing those those sorts of things rather than engaging de in debates um, as Bill and I did with Ken Ham. Um, moving forward with uh, creation, assuming that the goal is to uh, reduce or eventually eradicate creationism from um, any kind of educational aspects in school whatsoever. Um, how, what do you think the best approach uh, long term is? Um, there's because there's a lot of on the fence about uh, should you be nice, and obviously it's it's through context. It depends and whatnot. But as far as like the the grand scheme, the, the I mean it it it's um, it seems evident that we're doing pretty well, right? Church attendance is dropping and and so forth. Um, what what do you think are uh, really uh, important things to remember moving on? Um, I think it's important to remember that we're actually making progress, that the evidence shows that we're making progress. You know, I, uh, it's worth noting that there are many paths and many approaches. Uh, it's, there's no one magic silver bullet argument. There's no one um, magic way of, of doing this. You know, you, you get some of the arguments about diplomats versus firebrands, and, and I think those are caricatures anyway because I, I think I have at least personally the capacity to be both diplomatic um, and kind of in-your-face firebrand. When it comes to the actual change, and people ask me, well, what's your goal in doing all this? I want to change the whole world. 
I, you know, I don't know that I'm going to do it in my lifetime. I want to change the whole world. And by having a goal that I, I'm unlikely to reach, I think makes me a little bit uh, more effective than if I just kind of, I just kind of want to get information out. There is the unfortunate truth, in my opinion, uh, seems to be that you're going to have to wait for some portion of some generations to die out. And you're going to have to work for the people that you can reach to change the world around the others. There are people who just religion has really good defense mechanisms. And one of those defense mechanisms is I'm going to surround myself with people who share my beliefs and I'm going to stubbornly cling to this no matter how much evidence people present, no matter how, how many great logical arguments they present, uh, because it's uncomfortable for me to give up my beliefs. And so by changing the world around them, you make it more comfortable. And I think that that's one of the areas, you know, now we've got this, we've gone from, we were the, uh, the old white guys club who sat around and drank and railed against, uh, atheism, which or against religion, which by the way, wasn't the start. I mean, if you look back at what was happening at the end of the 19th century with, you know, Colonel Ingersoll and others, we took a huge step back in the early 20th century. Um, but we've gone, gone from that to a much more diverse group and we're dealing, we're dealing with more issues. Um, and now there's more approaches. I, I think everything looks absolutely positive. And, you know, as far as their trajectory, there may be lots of ups and downs, but the, the overall trend is towards a more secular world. And I've believed for a long time um, that reality is going to win out. That, you know, because we're talking about beliefs that are based on ignorance and fear and sticking gods into gaps, that as we learn more about the universe and spread that knowledge to more people, those gaps become smaller, the gods become weaker, they become more nebulous, the theologians do a tap dance until they believe in some abstract concept that can't be used to take away people's rights, uh, can't be used to uh, abuse educational systems. So this, the solutions are education, keep being positive representatives of rational thought, of skepticism, of critical thinking, um, change the world around some people, and then the last little component is time. I think it's inevitable. Um, so let's see. We are currently at 3286. Um, is there any particular incentive that you'd like to offer, Matt, as far as uh, maybe a goal? Maybe if we hit $3,400, you'll do X for uh, whoever donates. <laughs> like, like cut off all your hair like Jeff D. <laughs> A little late on that. So I've done done stuff uh, for Camp Quest where I did the show and drag, and I also dyed my beard bright pink. Um, but I've been unemployed since January, and I've got job interviews, so I can't do anything that you know makes me look uh, too out there during during the job interviews. But I'm trying to not get a job. Actually, I'm trying to set up a Patreon channel, do more, uh, write a couple of books, get some more talks and lectures, and see if I can't make a go of of. Uh, professional atheism. I don't expect that there's a ton of money in there, but there might be. Um, it looks like we're closing in on 3,300. Uh, if if anybody who donates, and, and I'll do this for three people, uh, anybody who donates 50 bucks while I'm on, you can have a 30 minute Google Hangout. Just ask me whatever the hell you want, because maybe your question's not getting asked here. For for the for the first three people who donate 50 bucks who actually want it. You can do a 30-minute Google Hangout with me. Um, if somebody wants to donate the whole 150, I'll give them 90 minutes. You know, and that that could be painful. I mean, that could, who knows? Ray Comfort might donate just to get 90 minutes to tell me how much he loves me and wants to keep me out of hell. Uh, I don't think you pay a whole lot of attention as yeah. far as that one goes. Yeah, um, I just, I just want to say, like, um, like, yes, I know you love me. <laughs> yeah, just to come in there, like. You can when you donate, you can put a message in your donation. So just say who you are, and I can forward all the details onto Matt. Like, where the best way to put him to get in touch with you. And also, you know, if you don't want to talk to me, uh, if, if that's not incentive enough, then you can just take those thirty minutes so nobody gets to talk. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so. Um... You you've done a lot of you've done done a lot of uh, actual like lectures, which mm -hmm. is, which is funny which is funny to me because you're asked to do lectures on things that you really self admittedly have no like formal education in. 
the main one I, I, for me is that I that I actually love. I actually love your lecture on this. Is uh, the superiority of sexu sec uh, Freudian slip there? Secular morality, um, and it's it's done so very well. Uh, yet you, yeah, you you're 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 very upfront with saying, I'm I'm not formally educated in this. This is not something that I have uh, any sort of degree in. Uh, but these are my thoughts, and they're usually pretty on the ball thoughts, as far as I as far as I've ever seen. Um, now. It, in it, you 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 sit, you've stopped doing the series uh, for a little while, and you said the main reason was because Sam Harris put out his book uh, a few years back, uh, mm -hmm. which pretty much outlined exactly what your thoughts were. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious because I think I think we're all in agreement, uh, at least you, me, Harris, uh, we're kind of in agreement as far as the moral realism aspect that uh, sort of objectivity can be applied to morality uh, given certain starting points um, but something that at least I'm in disagreement with Harris on I'm curious as to your thoughts are um, when it comes to applying morality uh, to human well-being um, my thoughts are that I don't find it uh, sufficient i think there's a lot of things that that he's probably missing out on in his sort of definition of what morality really is um one of he, he recently had a uh, a challenge uh he asked he told people that they could write a 1000 page essay and they could win money if they convinced him that he was wrong on his thesis in his book now uh one of the common responses that I saw, because I read through a decent amount of the responses to his challenge, was uh, the notion that his definition was insufficient uh, through sort of a thought experiment. Uh, I, I think it's I, I think it can be sufficiently called the benevolent dictator thought experiment, which is basically say you live in a society where there is no human suffering whatsoever, uh, but one of the main reasons for that is that there's a benevolent dictator that has injected everyone with a chemical that prevents them from having any urges to cause suffering to anyone. Um, would that be a society that we're okay with living in? And it, to my thought, no, I, I would not be okay with that. And if that's the case, it seems to me that human well-being isn't entirely what we're talking about here. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, but I'm curious about that. Sure. Um, so I gave the talk several times, and um, then Sam came out with Moral Landscape, and we were saying very similar things, and quite a bit about it, th I think he said better. Um, so I didn't see any need to keep giving it, plus there was a recorded version. Um, that hasn't stopped me from talking about it and answering questions about it pretty much everywhere I go. Um, I'm not sure what things you think he's missing out on. I mean, I'll, I'll address the kind of benevolent dictator uh, uh, objection, but I tend to agree with him that if we're not talking about well-being, I don't know what we're talking about. Um, and he he did the analogy, uh, basically argued that it was analogous to health, physical health. And I think that's spot on. I think that... Um, if morality means anything, when, when we're talking about, is this good, is this bad, is this moral, is this immoral, et cetera, that we necessarily need to be talking about health. And I'm, I think it's a combination of uh, physical health, mental health with respect to the individual, and then also societal health, that there's, there's this mesh. And that doesn't mean that there's easy answers. The benevolent dictator objection saying, hey, the reason that everybody in this society is getting along, that we're we're not taking immoral actions against each other is because somebody's injected with the chemical. Um, that to me seems to be an objection that some false influence is violating people's will or denying them some fr fundamental freedom. Um, and that may be the case. It may actually be objectionable. Uh, but I think you could also say that if it is in fact, I mean, if, if our brains are doing things because of the brain chemistry and the reason that people are immoral is because they are, uh, 
we are all weak thinkers. We are all lazy thinkers. We, it's difficult to sort through the how and why uh, behind whether or not an action is right or wrong. We are also very myopic in the sense that we focus first on the people closest to us and then go out. Um, we are also myopic with respect to time. And we are not very good at seeing the long-ranging impact of our actions. And so some people could say, well, slavery was really good for the slave owners, so who's, who's good are you, are you going to consider? And as I pointed out yesterday, I don't think that it's fair to say that slavery was good for the slave owners. Um, th that is a very myopic view because it may be the case, you know, we know that the world is better off with the, with, without slavery. So there may have been benefits that these slave owners were denying themselves by keeping slaves. And so it's, it's, you're looking at one specific, oh, they profited, these, these handful of individuals profited the most with the least amount of effort by, in, you know, keeping slaves. Um, and therefore, they were better off. Well, you don't know that. You don't know that they wouldn't have both profited, you know, even more. Because some of those slaves could have been the ones that invented new machinery or solved various problems or, you know, you know, cured diseases and made the whole world better. And so the elimination of slavery, um, you know, the, the rising tide lifts all boats things. If the chemical that we're injected with by this benevolent dictator is a chemical that allows us to think more clearly, to consider our actions and the consequences of our actions and make better moral decisions then I think it could be argued that that chemical is correcting problems in our brain and isn't necessarily violating somebody's will. I think it's a naturalistic fallacy to say, oh, you've injected a chemical in there. Now the brain is no longer functioning naturally, and this is detrimental to morality. Maybe we all have a chemical imbalance that we could correct and think better and be better moral creatures. Well, I mean... It's it's less it's less about that for me as far as why I find that that particular hypothetical world to be uh, distasteful. Um, there was there was a time uh, that just to make this a little more uh, maybe my, maybe my objection will be a little more easier to understand. Um, you and Tracy were talking about heaven once uh, a while back. I don't know what what episode it was. Me neither. It, it's whatever. But <laughs> you were talking about heaven. And it was the one with the Gorn. You were talking about uh, a sort of version of heaven that uh, some Christians believe in, wherein there is no urge to do evil in heaven. There's no urge to hurt anybody. There's no urge to do suffering or anything like that. And Tracy asked the question, can I really say that that's me then, if you're taking away my ability to want to do other things that, aren't, that may not be good? Uh, yeah. similarly to, uh, can you really say that that thing over there is a lion if it doesn't want to, uh, eat what lions eat, if it doesn't want to hunt, if it doesn't want to kill, if it doesn't want to do the things that lions do, then is it really a lion, so to speak? Yeah. Well, see, that's actually what I was trying to address is, it, you know, maybe it's a slightly different way of phrasing it. Um, if, if you're talking about a chemical that just eliminates the urges have are the people now fundamentally different yes are they different in a way that is substantive probably you know it, but it's not you know i the, the response that i gave was what if the chemical isn't taking away the urges but increasing your ability to assess the consequences of your actions one of the, the important things about morality is that we tend to hold brains or thinking agents morally responsible proportional to their ability to comprehend the consequences of their actions. So children aren't held to the same moral standard that adults are. And, you know, the other great apes aren't held to the same moral standards that we are. And, you know, a fish isn't as morally responsible as something else because there needs to be some demonstration that you understand and can take responsibility. So what if the chemical that the benevolent dictator is giving us is not taking away urges, taking away our natural uh, desires, um, which may not necessarily be a bad thing and may not change us necessarily in a bad way, but instead is giving us the ability to better consider the consequences of our action such that we resist those desires. I would argue that one of the greatest aspects of morality is the ability to consider the consequences of one's actions 
in order to trump one's natural urges. Yesterday on the Twitch stream, I play Path of Exile, sometimes some other stuff, but I, I play Path, and I was streaming yesterday. I've been streaming a lot uh, while I played. And one of the things that came up was this, you know, pedophiles and the discussions about pedophiles. And uh, as I pointed out, because I'd been corrected in the past, and I think it's worth passing it on, that it's not being a pedophile that's the problem. Pedophile simply means somebody who's sexually attracted to children. It's the actions that they take on behalf of that urge that is the problem. You know, it's it's not pedophile priests. The fact that we should stop calling them pedophile priests. What we should call them is what they are, which is child raping priests. And it's the, the actual act of raping a child that is the immoral act that is offensive. I don't think anything you think or feel is necessarily immoral. The morality is about actions. And so... If you gave a, a drug to a pedophile that made it so that they are no longer attracted to children, is that objectionable? I don't know. But if you gave a drug to a pedophile that kept it so that they were still sexually attracted to children, but that now they had better reasoning skills, better impulse control, such that they could w would never actually act on it, I don't see a problem with that. Um, I think there are ways, a number of different ways to potentially fix things, but I, I don't see this as a, as a response in any way to the core uh, issue of morality that I was setting out and that I think coincides with Sam's, which is if you begin with certain uh, presuppositions that life is generally preferable to death, and these are generalities, that you can construct a good secular system for evaluating the actions that we that we take actually the consequences of those actions to see how consistent they are with the values um i i don't know you know if you, if you give the pedophile drug so that they no longer have that attraction that may actually also be an improvement and it may not be a sufficient violation of the nature of who they are um we seem kind of attached to that and yet we change who we are all the time i'm a much different per different person than i was 10 years ago before i was doing the show and 20 years you know, before that. And it, I didn't become less me. Me changed. Uh, I can kind of see, I, I can see where you're coming from on this. Um, okay. Let's see. Because you asked me what, why I think that there's, there's really any sort of actual substantive lacking in the notion of, of human well-being being the driving force of morality. Um, uh, one of the problems that is generally consistently held with that is that it's a very vague notion, uh, much like Sam pointed out that health is still not properly entirely defined. Uh, right. But with human well-being, uh, I can still go with other with other also fairly vague things uh, like suffering and pleasure. Uh, those are also fairly vague. They can be done in different contexts. Uh, depends on the people sometimes. You got sadists, sadomasochists, uh, things like that. Um, but just taking those two, uh, I, I think those two would be sufficient to sort of encapsulate what we mean when we talk about human well being uh, mm -hmm. that suffering is bad uh, and, and is not conducive to human well being, while pleasure is good and is conducive to human well being. Um, so th the. The, the other thought experiment uh, that I believe was introduced early 20th century, I can't, I can't place the decade, but um, what it was was uh, the virtual reality thought experiment, such as I constructed a machine that when you get into it, you're going to be in it for the rest of your life, but you're going to experience a virtual reality where there is nothing but pleasure and there is no suffering whatsoever. Is there any reason that you can give using this version of morality to not get into that machine? Okay, so I definitely think that you know considerations of suffering and pleasure uh, are a part of well-being. And when I originally, you know, structured my version of it, um, I, I talked about the foundations being general rules that life is generally preferable to death, health is generally preferable to sickness, pleasure is ge generally preferable to pain. But pleasure is not always preferable to pain. If it weren't for pain, you wouldn't be aware that putting your hand on a stove is ultimately going to cause you harm. You need the pain to know that you're actually destroying tissue. Um, it may be the case that your, your health is uh, 
so deteriorated that your quality of life is diminished to the point where death could become preferable to life. So I, I picked those kind of three prongs to show that they're general rules, but they interact and there are exceptions to all of them. So the VR machine, the matrix like thing, we actually had this discussion the other day with, on, with Seth, um, you know, if you got out of the matrix and you knew everything about both sides, would you then, uh, you know, do what the one guy did, which is go back in the matrix and, and take the comfortable delusion and have your mind wiped, or would you stay outside? Um, and, and this goes to both the drug example and the VR machine that I, that I think you were talking about. And it was a very difficult question to answer. And I don't think I have enough information to actually give, um, a good enough answer about what I'd actually do. But, the idea of a machine that you sit in where you get absolutely nothing but pleasure. First of all, it's yes, I know it's a thought experiment, but it, thought experiments that, um, you know, who's running this machine, what's happening with everybody else, all this, lots of problems there. But we value things by placing them in contrast with other things. And you could certainly compare less pleasure with more pleasure. Um, but it may also be the case that you need some amount of pain in order to properly appreciate pleasure. But in any case, the example of putting your hand on the stove, if you're not getting the, the pain, then you don't know that you're actually doing harm. And so a machine that produces nothing but pleasure means that actual harm could be obscured, could be obfuscated and hidden. And that would be, I think, reason enough uh, not to advocate for it. But I don't know. I mean, that's fair enough. Um, the, 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 the reason why it was originally uh, produced was sort of to address what was, what was known then as uh, hedonistic consequentialism. Yeah. Uh, basically suffering and ple suffering and pleasure only things that really have any real value. Uh, you don't want suffering, you like pleasure. So yeah, if, it's, it's, it's it, for everybody. if I can chime in just with real quick thing, I was just, doesn't it take free will to determine that you wouldn't want to have no free will? Um, think so? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I, don't I was know just thinking if I because understand. Well, well, this machine where you're plugged in and they give you a chemical and fix you, and so you only do things that are prefer, uh, preferable and whatnot. We have to evaluate oh. that outside of the machine, don't we? To say that we yeah. wouldn't want to be in that machine. But that doesn't mean you need free will. You could be programmed to believe that you don't want free will. Well, wouldn't free will be the programming we have currently anyway? In in a sort of technical sense, it's elect you know, electro things going on in the brain. That's, 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 that's definitely a huge debate. Uh, there's, <laughs> did I just open a can of worms? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, th the last time I, I really sat down and listened to Matt talk about free will, it lasted for like two hours. So the nonprofits, the nonprofits did like a three hour show on it. I, I touched on it a couple times this weekend. Um, I can hit it real quick, which is generally I, I associate with uh, a Dan Dennett style uh, compatibilist. But when it comes to the simplistic libertarian free will and things like that, I think it's an illusion. Um, it's just that I have this appearance of will, whether it's an illusion or not, which is to kind of paraphrase Dennett, the freest will worth wanting, uh, as he puts it in elbow room. Um, and I'm fine with that. But what your your actual question is, you know, would it take free will to be able to determine that you don't want free will? Uh, I don't see that that's necessarily the case. I don't see why you, you couldn't. I, I could I could program a computer to not want free will, or at least say that it doesn't want free will. Maybe there's a difference between what it wants and what it says it wants, or doesn't want anything, and is wanting something necessarily free will? You know, is it mere desire, or is it uh, who knows? How much money have we raised? We actually raised a decent amount this hour. Uh, we're up to thirty-four twenty-eight now, uh, seventy-two dollars more, and we're at thirty-five hundred. Uh, so I don't see why we can't have uh, seventy-two more dollars in the next six minutes. I don't either. I don't either. And I'll stay on, you know, because uh, I had to duck out for a minute. 
Um, if you guys want to keep going, I can stay on longer. I don't, it's up to you. I just woke up. You guys have been up for hours. It's, it's mainly up to, to Zulu since he's running the whole thing. I don't know what he wants to do, uh, but he can go ahead and just type down whatever his preference is here. I personally would love to keep talking to you just because just because i don't give short answers well that's take up an hour <laughs> talking about morality you know when dpr jones does the doctors without borders uh benefit um for for a couple of years he, he would have me on last and i'd be scheduled for an hour but he'd put me on after somebody like james randy and you know i'm not gonna be able to top that so with with uh quality so i went for quantity and would end up doing you know two hours or two and a half hours and it always ran long um well, I mean, Matt, just it's, in the chat, it says, Matt, donate some money, pretty please. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've been unemployed since January. My my donation today, unfortunately, is merely going to be my time. So it's, it's not something that can generally be helped. I myself am quite poor. So what can you really do? Um, so the, the thing, the thing, the, the fun thing about um, generally my hours, at the very least, that I have the privilege of hosting for this event is that a lot of the people that I talk to are philosophically minded. And because of that, it's very easy to fill in as much time as, as possible, especially if I get into a conversation about morality, because it's, that's, it's, it's, that's the one that's near dear to my heart. Plus it's a debate that's been going on for thousands of years and still doesn't yeah. have like a clear answer at the end of the rainbow here. So it's it's you can make that conversation go on for as long as you want. Um, you like know, my wife, my wife uh, hates some of the conversations that I get into, just doesn't care about the topics. And so inevitably, when I'm around a bunch of people who enjoy philosophy and abstract thinking and and, you know, dealing with these topics like identity, uh, we'll end up talking about like the transporter problem. You know, if you step into a Star Trek transporter are you committing suicide and a copy of you is being made? Or it, does the transition to the pattern mean that you, you are actually uh, you know, staying alive? And we'll have these arguments and discussions and, and break it all down. And it's all, you know, some of it's rooted in science fiction, but basically it's rooted in the philosophy of, of, of determining identity and self. And she just wants nothing of it. And it's just uh, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go get a drink. So we should probably, we should probably scatter the questions around to a number of different topics, just so that if there are people like my wife watching, uh, you know, they, they don't get up and leave like, Oh my God, won't these guys shut up about this? That's fair enough. Uh, that's actually a pretty fair point. Um, so one of the other things that, uh, you delve into quite frequently, and this is, it's mainly because of your sort of epistemic view is epistemology in general. Like, how do we know that we know things? Uh, that kind of deal. Um, like, is do you have maybe uh, a decent summarization of what you feel your epistemology is? If you think there, there might be any problems that are lacking in it? Um, if it, Like, what, how, how do you feel about your current state of being able to know things? Really? This is where you want to go after that last comment? Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not morality, is it? No, it's, it's not. Would you rather um, I ask you about your favorite sports team? Well, that'd be easy. I don't, don't really, I mean, I grew up in Kansas City, so I'm a default, you know, like Chiefs fan, but I, I don't care enough about sports, most, most sports to care. Uh, so kind of quickly on the epistemology front, I touched on this a little bit during the, the side debate. Um, I think that knowledge may in fact be an ultimately useless label. Um, you know, we've been, philosophers have been debating on the, uh, wow, we're $55 to get to 35,000. That's pretty impressive. Uh, I didn't know I could, you know. I didn't know we raised over $30,000 in the past hour. 10 times as much money in the last 10 minutes. Uh, maybe they really liked the, the kind of, morality and epistemic things so the philosophers have been toiling with this question of how do we know and i think it's a good thing to toil with i just don't think that there is a solution and i think that the solution may be that um depending on the definition of knowledge we don't know anything um so sai for example even though he will deny it on occasion, it's very clear that when he's talking about knowledge, he's talking about absolute certainty. This is a, a, a critical component to his 
understanding of epistemology. And it's not a critical component in most of philosophy. As a matter of fact, almost, I mean, the bulk of philosophers would, would readily admit that we can't be absolutely certain about anything. And that's why knowledge has a, a much more standardized uh, definition of justified true belief. Um, but there's problems with that. How do you determine whether or not it's justified and how do you confirm that it's true? And does the true smuggle in an absolute certainty? You know, what's the definition of truth? So this is why I pointed out that because Sai and I have a different definition of truth, we're going to have a different definition of knowledge, even if we agree that knowledge is justified true belief. And the point that I ended up making is that the word knowledge may, in fact, be meaningless and appeals to knowledge may in fact be useless. And generally speaking, while I care about the subject and I enjoy having the, the philosophical discussions about it, I don't care whether or not cl somebody claims to know something. What I care about is if they believe something. Um, they may, so colloquially, colloquially speaking, it's, knowledge is quite often represented as I believe this very, 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 very strongly, or I believe this so strongly that it would be worldview altering for it to be wrong. Um, that's, you know, we, we get hyperbolic and say, oh, I know this and I know that and I know this. But what we're really saying quite often is I believe this and I believe it very strongly. So I don't care about knowledge claims um, in most uh, settings. I care about belief claims. Tell me what you believe and why. Because your beliefs inform your actions. And we don't wait until we have knowledge to act. And we don't wait until we have absolute certainty to act. So having big discussions about, you know, what is knowledge and how do we have knowledge, uh, I think it's missing the point. And the point, a better place to focus is on what do you believe? What are you convinced is true or likely true, irrespective of how strongly you believe it? And why do you believe it? Because that gets to the root of skepticism and critical thinking about rational thought, about how you reach conclusions, whether or not you count them as knowledge. Uh, how do you reach the, the, the package of beliefs in your head? Um, because those beliefs are what impact what we do. Of course, the, the methodology in, in getting there is definitely the biggest, the biggest thing uh, as far as any sort of ep epistemic conversation goes. Um, I, I don't know. See, I, when you're talking about absolute certainty being impossible, uh, I'd agree if you're talking about something other than what some might call justified true belief. Uh, through, through some methods, we can determine there are some things that we know for certain if we talk about that through the context of something that's justified as being true. Uh, <laughs> I think the only, but I think the list of that is very small. Well, that's what I used to think. Huh? That, that's what I used to think. I used to say that we could be absolutely certain about the logical absolutes and about esoteric claims and labels and things like that. Um, and I had, to, I had to acknowledge that I was wrong about that, at least in the phrasing. What I meant by it was, was not necessarily wrong, but calling it absolute certainty is wrong, which is why during the side debate I, I identified that as maximal certainty, which may or may not be absolute, but it is as certain as we can be. The logical absolutes, uh, uh, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, they are, as far as I can tell, true. They seem to be as close to absolutely true as anything could be, but it's, I think it's probably technically more correct to say that we are maximally certain about those and that maximal certainty may or may not equate to absolute certainty. Because, you know, when, when I used to go with Descartes' uh, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, uh, as an absolute confirmation that I exist, irrespective of whether the reality I experience is real. Um, but as Hobbes, I think, and others uh, pointed out, the argument actually presupposes the validity of reason. So there's some package of presuppositions that you're just going to have to accept that you apparently can never actually demonstrate even though they, um, they, are, they represent maximal certainty. They are as certain as we can be about anything, whether or not it's absolute. But now you're, I had to do that because uh, of the way the presuppositionalists argue. Um, but generally speaking, you know, when you're talking with people, you know, we say we're absolutely certain about things that we couldn't possibly be absolutely certain. It's you know, a bit of hyperbole. But when it comes to things like the logical absolutes and math, you know, things that are two plus two equals four in base 10. 
I mean, am I not absolutely certain about that? Well, that's actually predicated on whether or not reason is reliable and how, how do you demonstrate it? So this goes back a little bit to the, um, the incompleteness theorem that, you know, no system is going to be able to verify itself. I wasn't that, wasn't that something that I, I think that was addressed by Socrates. Uh, if I remember correctly, I can't remember. I, don't ask me which, what book I read it in, but uh, I believe it was Socrates who was having an argument with somebody uh, and they asked him the question, uh, can you provide me with, uh, can you explain why reason is reasonable or why we should accept reason is valid? And I think Socrates' response was to even ask the question already presupposes that reasoning has some sort of validity. Yeah, but That's, it does presuppose that reason is absolutely valid. So I mean, it's, it's, it's also an answer to say that reason is reasonable because that's a tautology. But then the question becomes, OK, it's a tautology and we we can agree on that. And we we can agree that this appears to be. Um, consistent and the same and necessary even, uh, but we can't demonstrate that because we're then using reason to confirm reason which has to pre one at some level you've got to presuppose that it's going to lead you to a correct answer i think the, the good thing is that uh we can make a good case because we live in a world where we where we reach conclusions based on evidence and probability and all of the evidence that exists and all of the evidence that we could even imagine existing supports the idea that reason is reasonable and always has been and always will be and this kind of niggling little debate about absolute certainty is ultimately irrelevant, which is why I went with maximal certainty. I mean, it does work. Uh, I mean, the only things that I was referring to are basically things like logical absolutes and uh, things that are true because if they, because it's impossible for them not to be true. Like, yeah. for instance... But how I, did you determine that it's impossible for them to not be true? Well, I know I'm not omniscient. How do you uh, know? How do you because know? Because if I wasn't, then I'd know. Well, rather, if I was, then I'd know. Yeah, I hate to be playing the psi role here. <laughs> um, like that, it's it's impossible for me to not know that I am in fact omniscient, because by definition, I know. Like yeah. it's it's those very esoteric. But that, but that presupposes reason. That presupposes the logical absolutes, which I'm fine doing, by the way. That's what I'm advocating. I mean, I mean, that's that's kind of the point that a lot of people raise with presuppositionalism in the first place is that, yeah, you can say that there's presuppositions made on in any philosophy and, and that there, when you dig far enough, there's going to be points where you just can't dig deeper. By the way, you, you do realize that we have now ultimately failed at avoiding the conversations that some people hate. <laughs> I, we have. But if you throw I, the transport I, argument in, we'll have the trifecta. Here's the thing, though. I'm enjoying myself, and we're up to 3,610. That's so. cool. Are there, question, are there questions coming from chat that I've missed? I mean, there may be, uh, there may be some questions that, uh, that people wanted asked that maybe they didn't have 50 bucks to get uh, a 30-minute session. Um, yeah, there's a question from uh, Mechanic. Uh, Mechanic wants to know, Max Man, why you no speak? Well, I'm speaking. There you go. Merry Christmas. And the reason he doesn't talk is uh, why he doesn't speak is because I speak too much. No, no, absolutely not. I, usually I, I sort of, I, I feel bad because I'll come on to these things and I'll ask so many questions and sort of take over. And I know Lundy's just like, he was yearning to, uh, to pick your brain on some of these deep philosophical aspects. So I'm, I'm trying my best to sit back and just shut up, which is really difficult for me. So, so which is actually kind of weird for me because there are, Plenty of people who would like Ozymandias Ramsey's second. Uh, I'd recommend picking his brain on these topics because it's his brain that I picked to help uh, correct me and and revamp some things. Um, that, that guy is uh, brilliant and, and was extremely helpful. Um, to answer at least one of the questions in chat, somebody says, how, how to find a link to your Patreon channel when it goes up. Um, just follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, as soon as that thing goes live, you can get, I don't like asking for money. I've been terrible about asking for money. I've been, 
I've been doing this stuff primarily as a volunteer for more than about 10 years or so now. Um, and I, I'm, I'm bad at even asking for money for organizations that I support. I'm happy to do fundraisers, but it's like, oh, give me money. It just feels wrong. Um, but having been unemployed for six months and being kind of disillusioned with the, the software industry in general, um, getting a Patreon channel up, getting uh, books out. I'm also, I've got t-shirts that I've been selling, you know, through Compass 120 Free Thought, which has worked out, uh, you know, really well. It's a couple, couple bucks here and there. Um, I think that if I'm, if I'm not asking for donations, like for me, it's about um, I'm going to produce content. My time has some value. And if people value it, value it and want to donate, great. If not, not. Uh, so follow me on Twitter and, um, and you'll find out there. But today it's about raising money for Engineers Without Borders. And I'm thrilled that we've you know, done so well in the last hour or so. And I'm happy to keep going for a while. I'd like to give shorter answers to a number of different questions for all the people who are um, – patiently waiting while I wax philosophical for an hour and a half. Well, let's see. We got it. We got, we do have a guest here who's uh, asking what your thoughts are on uh, the two different positions on what anti-theism is. Uh, the one position that anti-theism is the positive assertion that there is no God. Then there's the Hitchens version, which is, uh, I believe being essentially anti-religion uh, yeah. as a whole. Um, like, what are you, what are your thoughts? Do you, do you prefer one over the other, uh, or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a video on my YouTube channel where, where I address this. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of both of them. This is one of a handful of places where I disagree with Hitchens. Um, and I do so, I think with pretty good reason and, and fairly strongly, uh, just the label itself, anti-theism. Theism has nothing to do with religion. Theism is the top level thing. You can be a theist and not be involved in any specific religion or be religious or anything else. Um, it, it is the top level of do you accept that a God exists, which is separate from religion. You know, I don't know why you would say anti-theism is opposition to religion when a much better label for that, in my opinion, would be anti-religion. Uh, I'm an anti-religionist or I'm opposed to religion. Uh, so I tend to opt for anti-theism in a way that equates it with what has also been called hard atheism, which has also been called strong atheism, which has also been called in some connotations positive atheism. Uh, I think that, it, but the problem is, uh, what good is a label if we can't agree on its usage? It's not like the label has some intrinsic meaning. And so it's only as useful as our ability uh, to understand each other. And so I'm pretty much in favor of just dropping the label. Um, and being much more clear in some other way. I'm not tied to my usage uh, of anti-theism. I just have to think that it's more accurate than the one that, that, that Hitchens was advocating, but I think they, they're roughly related. Um, I actually got a question about the, um, a, a lot of people complain that uh, they don't like using the atheist title because of the shock value it, it poses to certain people and whatnot. And I understand that they were rather uh, refer to themselves as skeptics or free thinkers or, and, and whatnot. But um, I, I've proposed, I, I don't know if I made a video about this or not, but I've proposed that the shock value that the word atheist, the connotations that go along with it is actually a good thing. When yeah. people are shocked by that, it makes them think generally or at least think about it, right? Um, bad publicity is good publicity, right? So, uh, yeah, so what are, I'm just wondering what, what your thoughts are on the, the shock value of the term atheist. I agree. And uh, to give a, a slightly longer answer, by all means, use whatever label you're comfortable with. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not telling people what label they should use for themselves. There are a ton of different labels that fit me in a number of different ways. They're not, um, they don't all fit me entirely. I don't have any objection to anybody using the label of their preference. I do have objections to people who, and, and I'll, I'll pick a specific example, don't just opt for, let's say, the agnostic label because they think that that's what fits them best, but instead go on to say that I use the agnostic label because atheists are just like religionists or atheists are just as fundamentalist, you know, disparaging some other label that demonstrates uh, monumental ignorance about, you know, what, what the term, how the terms are actually used. Um, and 
it's kind of the same thing when people are, you know, like, don't be a dick. Uh, I think that's a pretty dick move. It's not like the, the fire brands are telling the diplomats, stop being nice. I think we need all approaches. And I also think that we need a number of different, different labels. Um, but I use the atheist label because it fits and because there is uh, some shock value. I think that some people need to be shocked slightly to get them to pay attention, to get them to think more about why they feel the way they feel about certain things. Yeah, I, I also think it's uh, beneficial in the sense that uh, when people use the term atheist, it gets the word out there. Um, I myself, my, through my own personal experience, um, I was an atheist long before I ever knew what an atheist was. So once I found, or heard that word and looked it up, found out what it meant, I was like, oh, crap, there's other people like me. That's convenient. And when, when Sam Harris suggested um, that we use a different term, um, and others have too. I mean, you know, Dennett and, and, the, and some guys were in favor of using brights. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of, of the term. I'm not completely opposed to it. If you're a bright and you want to call yourself a bright, great. Um, but saying that we should stop using the term because of the baggage, uh, the, the conversation that I imagine in my head is one that I've had with people who are reluctant to use the label is, okay, well, what label are you going to use? Bright? What's that mean? And then you have this discussion about what bright means. And you go and you, you spend this some chunk of time. And then somebody says, well, wait, so you don't believe in a God? Yeah. And doesn't that mean you're an atheist? And, and so you've you've taken a chunk of precious time to get to atheist in order to avoid using the atheist label. That's not always going to happen, um, but it seems to me it's going to happen often enough that I, I'd just rather adopt the label and say really quickly that I'm an atheist. That means I don't believe in a god. It doesn't necessarily mean I claim certainty that there are no gods or that there or even claim that there are no gods at all. I just don't believe. Um, that's and for somebody who doesn't give quick answers, that's a quick enough answer that didn't take me from bright to blah 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 all the way down the trail. Wow, I, I'm I'm surprised you brought up brights. I had almost forgotten about that whole episode. It's... So is so is the entire world. It's been, it hasn't been <laughs> effective at all. It, that there's really enough, was a quick fad, wasn't it? Well, you know, there's enough people who don't even know uh, about the atheist label. That if you start trying to do subtle changes to this, I, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know that labeling and branding is the issue. I think having the bigger conversations and educating people about things, um, and you could educate people on on bright or free thinker or secular humanist or whatever. And I am a secular humanist and a free thinker and uh, maybe an agnostic, depending on your definition of knowledge. Uh, but I, I don't know that. Let's, you know, oh, Bright didn't work out. Let's come up with another one. You know? I just, I love the simplicity of atheist. I don't believe in a God. There you go. Yep, it, I'm with you. Yeah. All right. Um, is there any questions from the chat? Somebody or any that you've picked out, Matt or Lundy, that you guys? Yeah, uh, there, was a, there was a question earlier. It was a very simple question. Uh, it's just sort of a recommendation question for, uh, for Matt. Uh Top five YouTube channels that you recommend. That you <laughs> How do I science? <laughs> Sorry, I just <laughs> you science by sciencing. <laughs> it's just so obvious. Um, come from. <laughs> so YouTube channels. I, l let me actually pull up my uh, YouTube page. So one of the things is, I hate to say this, I don't tend to listen to podcasts, including my wife's podcast. I don't think I've listened to more than one full episode of the nonprofits since uh, Jeff and Russell and Dennis have kind of kicked that off again. Um, I do read um, some blogs, but I don't spend a lot of time on atheist related YouTube channels. I watch some videos when people send them to me. I have some people who I think are just absolutely brilliant. Um, but one of my fears is that it, it's kind of a, a delicate balance. You want to listen to to other people to get ideas and help you think, but you don't want to end up parroting other people. Um, and also there's a limit because I deal with this so much. I mean, I have, uh, let me look at my inbox, 2,608 unread emails in my inbox. And that was after archiving 4,000 of them a couple months ago and 4,000 a couple months before that. And then there's also 
Facebook. Anyway, I'm way, way off track. I get tons of messages, tons of interaction. And so I, when I get my downtime to where I would watch YouTube videos, they're not always about atheism related. So looking at the subscriptions, I have um, watchmojo.com because they produce uh, kind of brainless top 10 lists of top 10 summer songs, top 10 Harry Potter characters, whatever. It's some, some crap to play in the background. Um, I have a couple of magic related channels that I subscribe to, uh, several gaming channels that I subscribe to. Since I'm playing Path of Exile, I, I'm subscribed to Ziggity Gaming. Uh, Snake Bites, which became Animal, Animal Bites TV just the other day. Uh, Number File, uh, The Young Turks, uh, Quirkology, CGP Grey, Ted, Minute Physics, Scam School. Uh, Brian's here in town. and uh, Scam School is great. I love that channel. Yeah, he's actually, he lives here in town, and uh, he's given me some help in setting up the studio in the new ACA building. Uh, computer File, Thinking Atheist. Uh, there's a pinball channel, because I'm, I'm an old school pinball and, and pool. Um, then there's some music stuff like uh, Walk Off the Earth. Then uh, Atheist Voice, uh, The Royal Institute, Crash Course. Healthy Addict, um, Darren Brown, Osmandius, Arn Raw, obviously, Potholer 54, Qualia Soup, um, Vertassium, a couple woodworking things, uh, Ricky Gervais, um, and Jacqueline Glenn, and a handful of others. Um, I don't watch everything everybody does, but those are the subscriptions that I have so that I don't miss uh, as much of the things that I would miss if I didn't have the subscriptions. Real quick, if I can give you a recommendation, I don't know if you know the channel, uh, but I fell in love with them as soon as I was introduced to them. Uh, they're called Cinema Sins. Uh, yes. Yeah. Love those guys. I don't think I have. I don't think I'm subscribed. Uh, actually, my subscriptions run off the page, so it's hard for me to. Oh yeah, here's 20 more of them. Uh, but it doesn't look like Cinema Sins, uh, Cinema Sins is on there. Um. Yeah. They're they're, def they're definitely one of my currently one of my favorite people to listen to just because I don't know there's just something about picking apart very popular movies. Uh, it's the, it's the sort of sort of analytic deconstruction thinking and lateral thinking stuff that I think works well in debates and discussions. If you can, you know, find the continuity flaws, then you're in, in the film it increases your your or attests to your powers of observation. If you can find the logical flaws, then that you know, attest to your reasoning skills. So uh, it's not like these things are useless. Um, I think, I think they help, you know, you know, one of the things I said when people say, what influenced you, what, how did you become an atheist? And I, you know, I, I well, David Hume and Voltaire and uh, Robert Greene Ingersoll and, and all these great thinkers, but, but also uh, Rush and Pink Floyd and Rocky Horror Picture Show. And, you know, m m the, the movies and, and entertainment media helped influence me as much as anything else. I am the product of everything I've experienced. Yeah, but picking apart movies in a critical way is also um, very uh, annoying to one's spouse or significant other, I've noticed. <laughs> I... It's also annoying to some friends who like said movies. Like, I really like this movie. Well, you know, there were some problems with it. I overall liked it, but then this happened and this happened, and, and they get angry with you. and They say, why do you have to ruin good things for me? Well, what's, what's really fun is when you go to the movie theater and you watch a movie and you got um, people that are specialized in different areas, right? Like you have somebody who's uh, uh, really good in philosophy, somebody who's really good, like uh, me, myself, I'm in engineering and so forth. So I'll pick out the uh, specific engineering points, like in the one James Bond movie where the, the excavator claws into the train and he runs along it. Um, excavators don't have a walkway welded onto the arms and the booms, so... You know, I point that out and then you get, you know, this great conversation going in the movie theater. And of course, there's some cliches attached to that. But it, it's interesting how um, Hollywood Hollywood is. I guess that's why Mythbusters is so awesome, too. So an engineer, a philosopher and a biologist walk into a movie theater. Is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of skepticism in that back row. All right. Um uh, I kind of had I kind of had this conversation uh, uh, with um, with one of my other hours, with, which was with uh, uh, Dr. Begini and uh, 
uh, Ollie, who is a philosophy tube on YouTube. Uh, mm -hmm. There's there's just such a there, there's an enrichment process in taking apart any media that you're that you're that you're enjoying, be it movies, TV shows, video games, whatever you're enjoying. There's there's a process of being able to analyze it that for some people it seems to make that make make the medium a lot more enjoyable but then for some other reason for a lot of other people uh they seem not to like it when uh yeah. when that sort of analysis is done uh, like it's a very sort of anti-intellectual stance like don't think about it too much it's just a movie or it's just a game or it's just a show but it, it, it just seems to me that the people who put this this these sort of uh these sort of mediums out there they're already inserting their own sort of philosophies into it. They're already inserting their own values into it. They're, they're, they're putting that out there for public discourse uh, just by virtue of making the product. So I, I just feel like why deny them the chance at being a part of the conversation uh, if the expression of their thoughts is reflected in whatever they're doing? It just well, seems to be the point. <laughs> So for me, as a matter of personal enjoyment, it, it runs a, a really, I do both. So there are plenty of things that I enjoy, which I realize are terrible, that have terrible, you know, science in it, uh, you know, that are horribly flawed. Um, and yet I'm able to not quite turn off my brain and enjoy it, but just ignore those things. I have no problem with, for example, fantasy stuff, as long as the universe remains consistent. It's when when they break their own rules for the sake of a story that kind of is jarring to me and sets me back. And so that there, there are fantasy novels and series and stuff that I I've enjoyed. I like, sometimes I like picking stuff apart. I have the nitpickers guide to star Trek, the next generation on my bookshelf where they basically went through every episode and, you know, picked out their favorite flaws, at least for, I think, I think the book was printed for the first six seasons when I got it. Um, so I like that stuff, both doing it and, you know, kind of engaging in it as an observation. But I can also just watch stuff. But I don't I don't know that the fact that some people like it and some people don't, it doesn't mean that anybody uh, is being prevented from doing it unless unless you're in a situation like Max might have been talking about where, you know, I like doing this and my spouse doesn't. And if I'm going to do it while they're watching, then I'm fucking up the experience for them. <laughs> and that's probably something that I should avoid, you know get your get your mst3k fans together to do one thing and then sit down and watch it and enjoy it with with other people at another time all right so uh zulu is telling us to uh probably wrap up here in about four minutes oh is it because i dropped an f-bomb i didn't know if i was yeah. <laughs> oh no you're absolutely well, allowed to fucking swear like it. it's it, it's not a fucking deal or anything don't worry about I it i figured as much see yeah, we no. we we had just like so many donations during your hour that he's like, just keep going, just keep going. <laughs> we'll milk this as long as possible. Yeah, we don't want to go too long. Otherwise, it looked instead of looking like we raised a lot of money in my time, it might have just been that I talked for nine hours and <laughs> yeah, people were um, paying to cut me up. So we are currently at thirty six thirty. That is a huge increase from where we started on this hour. So Matt did his job. He brought in the donations. He brought in the people that we needed. Uh, Absolutely. Actually, if I can lead the charge right now and just uh, thank Matt so much for uh, donating his time. And I think I speak on behalf of a lot of people by saying we absolutely love everything you do. The more content you put out there, the better. Well, stop that. Stop loving everything I do because I'm wrong sometimes, you know, do, like the things that I do that are that are right and good. But, <laughs> I, you know, I want to thank you guys for inviting me, uh, letting me kind of uh, be last. But mostly thanks to the people who donated um, get me the names of the, the first three folks who donated the 50 bucks and we'll, we'll, we'll arrange a time where we can do a hangout. Um, and we'll either record it or not. It's up to them. Um, but I, I love the fact that, you know, our community is broadening. And one of the, one of the things that we need to do a better job is, uh, build communities that support, that act as a landing place for people who are leaving religion and groups like recovering from religion and some of the Sunday assemblies and stuff are doing things like that. But where we often get challenged is in our charitable efforts and our support of the broader community. Um, and I think this is unfair because religions have had a, a very privileged position for a long time where they've been tax exempt and they have built in structures and they have the infrastructure that is there ready to be used. And what 
you got what you guys have done here and what others have done is demonstrated that we're not only building that infrastructure, but we're making use of, you know, YouTube and, and streaming media and stuff like that um, in ways that other people might not be. We have a, a different way of going about it, but we are contributing to a better world. And so thanks to you guys and thanks to everybody who donated. All right. Uh, so we have about one minute left. I'm going I'm to use that time to uh, first thank Max Man for coming on this hour. Uh, I know you got kind of drunk last night and it's probably very difficult for you to get up to uh, to, to do the rest of the show. But uh, I appreciate you being here anyway. You did help keep the keep the ball rolling, so to speak. Uh, and also, of course, thank you to Matt for being here. Uh, we appreciate it. And I actually got to do my interview with Matt. Fuck yes. Uh, <laughs> so thank you for everybody for being here. Uh, the next, I don't know how long this next part's going to be, but it's essentially going to be the wrap up for the entirety of the 24 hours. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it was just going to limit it to a half hour, but we are going to be announcing the idiot of the year award winner, uh, which is going to take a tally vote on the people who wanted to write in, uh, Jordan from spirit science. Um, as well as all the, uh, other voters on the official poll, that's going to be fun. And we're also just going to be, of course, wrapping up the entire thing, thanking everybody for being here. And uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, we'll see you all on the next segment. Uh, thanks again for being here and have a good day.